All right, today we're talking about drain care. I gotta figure out what some effects do. Anyway, so um, today we're actually talking about drain care. Drain care, it's kind of interesting. We just had a patient come in today that was shot probably a year ago and they were talking about their drains and there were some misconceptions about it. It just really is a topic that not only do patients have a hard time understanding, physicians as well and medical students have a hard time understanding. So if the physician doesn't understand it that well, it's hard for us to explain it to a patient. So today we're kind of going to talk about all types of drains, how do you take care of drains, what a drain is, why you get it, and all that good stuff. Indications. So the main reason you get a drain is to prevent something from happening. It could be because you don't want fluid to accumulate. It could be because you don't want air to accumulate in some space or you want to just see how much fluid is collecting in a space. If you have something like an abscess, blood, pus, whatever, if it stays in a space, a contained space over time, what will happen is that space will develop a pseudocapsule. Um, I have a video on YouTube that shows a lady that had a hematoma for a while and we ended up having to go in and take out her pseudocapsule because her hematoma was not adequately drained in the emergency room. So it can require a second surgery if it's not drained. It can also take a cavity that's filled with pus, excuse me, a cavity that's sealed with blood or one that's filled with fluid maybe from a breast abscess gets infected and then turns into pus. So there are a lot of complications with just random fluid collections in the body. Air is another problem. If you have air in a space and it's not just like on Deku's lungs, it could be even in a cavity in your leg, air is not something that the body traditionally heals with. We're about 65, 70% water. So there's never a situation where you're just gonna have air hanging out in the spot, even in your lungs. If you think about it, your lungs are, it's really not just air, it's humidified air. Um, so air can dry out a space, puts it at risk for infection. So you don't want a air space to stay in something. So sometimes we put a drain in that. Third one is if there's a space that you know is going to fill up with fluid, sometimes we put drains in them just to say, hey, how much fluid is being produced? That can help determine whether we need to do surgery or observation. If it's a fistula and you want to characterize the output, sometimes we put drains in those. If it's um, maybe something in the pelvis or a cavity in the pelvis and we want to see whether it's scarred down or it's still full, and fluid is accumulating, we'll put a drain in that space. So realistically, a drain is there to prevent something from happening. Now, truth be told, we've been using drains for thousands of years. It may not have been a Dayball drain or a JP drain. It may be just sticking something in a wound so that it doesn't completely heal over. When we talk about drains, they usually fall into two categories. It's either a passive drain or an active drain. Passive drain doesn't require suction and drains by gravity, pressure. When you sit on your, on your butt, there's pressure applied. So if you put a drain in a space, squeeze it down, fluid comes out, that drain, that's passive. Versus active is usually connected to a suction device. Somebody's knocking on the door. Who's that, Chrissy? Tell them to go around if we don't know who it is. Who is it? Tell them to go around. Oh, tell let her in. That's Misty. Just let her in. Okay. That's one of our former employees. We had to take her key because she was stealing stuff. I thought she was stealing stuff, Misty. That's why. Um, so anyway, sorry about that. That's Misty. So anyway, passive drains versus active drains. Um, I'll try to edit that out. I may not. Um, with a passive drain, you actually can use that as well as um, to not just a closed space. Think of an abscess. If you open an abscess up, what you don't want to happen is for it to close up through over the skin and then you have a fluid collection that remains. That happens a lot of times when abscesses aren't adequately drained. In that situation, you'll pack it and leave it open. That four by four is a passive drain. Other types, Penrose drain is basically a strip of plastic that is a collapsible tube. It almost looks like a ribbon. Um, 
we use those a lot in the operating room, especially in cavities that we don't want to pack or can't pack because they're long tracks, but at the same time, we don't want them to heal quickly. Pigtail drain um, is usually placed in radiology. Um, that can be passive or active. Sometimes they'll hook a suction bulb up to that. Four by four gauze, stuffing it in there, leaving it, pulling it out two, three days. Iodoform gauze, which the emergency room loves um, for whatever reason, is a passive drain. Um, iodoform is basically a candle wick, a big one, that is soaked in not betadine, but um, a betadine type solution that prevents it from healing. All you're trying to do is to get the wound to heal from the inside out, and that's what that's for. Iodoform gauze does not help a wound heal. It prevents wound healing, but it does assist in wound drainage. So that if you want a wound that you need to heal, you would never use iodoform gauze. You would only use a 4x4. But if you want it to drain like an abscess on the face that you can't make a huge incision on, but you want it to drain, you stuck some iodoform in, you stick some iodoform in there, it will then drain over time. And then when you pull it, either repack it if it's a deep hole or pull it out one time, then the skin will heal behind it and it should heal up. Zeroform gauze, another kind of um, dressing that again is not designed to heal wounds. It really delays wound healing, but the whole reason it's there is to delay wound healing so that it can heal from the deep part up. Yes, this is crossing over between abscesses and drains, but you really want an abscess to drain. That's the whole way that an abscess heals. So you're using a passive drain i.e. a dressing change. If it's a 4x4, four four, you would love to change it once a day. Penrose usually is sewn in place so you can't change those every day. Pigtail is placed in by radiology so there's some reasons to pull them out, when and when not to pull them out. We'll talk about that later in indications and drain care. Um, again, iodoform gauze usually should come out in 48 hours. 4x4 um, uh, four four drain should be changed every two days. The longest you could probably go is three days. Um, zero form gauze makes a mess. We usually use it to cover the top of a wound. Sometimes you can actually pack it in a wound. If you do that, it's a special situation and it should be changed probably every day. Now, passive, active. So active drains are basically drains that are thin, flexible, that have some type of suction device. A JP drain is probably the most common one we use. Um, that one is placed all the time in surgery. We often use it um, for thyroid surgery, for colon surgery afterwards, for esophageal surgery. Um, anytime we expect a lot of fluid, whether it's blood or closing a potential space like you do in thyroid surgery, Maybe you have a colon operation and you're not sure that connection is going to heal. You're worried about a colon leak. A JP drain will be a good thing to place around that area. There are a host of other ones as well. Three-way Davol drain is a big drain that we usually use with pancreatic necrosis. The nice part about it is it has an irrigation port and it has a suction port. And it's a very big drain, so it can pull big particles out of it. Versus a JP is a very small drain, and it's primarily used for fluid. Hemovac, kind of a fancy, small JP drain. So that thing has like an accordion on it, and you basically squash the accordion down, and then the springs in it push back, and that um, creates suction. So those drains are typically used for very small spaces that have the potential to create a lot of fluid. So sometimes around spinal surgeries, you'll see those. Um, chest tube. Funny part is a chest tube is actually a active drain. You hook it up to a uh, suction and it drains. When it's done, you can actually make it a passive drain by putting it to water seal. So, um, and also we use chest tubes, not just for lungs. If you have heart surgery, sometimes they'll put two or three chest tubes in to drain the pericardium so that you don't acquire fluid around your heart. But again, if it's around the heart, you probably don't want to hook it up to suction. So we use this chest tube as a passive drain. So there's a lot of times that we kind of flip between one of these. Um, 
as far as chest tubes go, I've got a whole lecture to, dedicated to chest tubes. It pretty much goes over how to set it up, how it works. Um, I'll put that together and post that and put a link from this one to that one and vice versa so we can cover chest tubes because it's an entire lecture on its own. Now, from a patient slash medical student standpoint, the next question is how do you take care of a drain? The most important thing is it depends on where the drain is coming from and which drain it is, okay? Chest tubes are taken care of a little differently than JP drains. But again, <clears throat> there are certain small things that you can say you do for all of them. The first thing is keeping the skin where the tubing enters clean. Soap and water. Do not buy fancy wound care gels, fancy wounds, washings, spa, whatever. It literally is soap and water. Antibacterial would be helpful, but not necessary. Soap and water, wash it when you get in the shower, tub, whatever. Wash it, dry it, treat it like normal skin. Some of these drains, you do have to watch your wound care because if you get in the shower, the majority of these drains, it's not gonna make a big deal. If you get in the tub, that's a whole different issue, especially if it's a new, a new one, because as you can imagine, it fills up with fluid. So traditionally, what I tell everybody is if you have a drain, take showers until the drain is out, wait 48 hours for that hole to heal over, and then you can start taking uh, tub baths. But for the most part, soap and water, let it run down, wash it, it'll be fine. Change the dressing daily. This is not so much because of the drain, it is because you have a foreign body going into your body, your body is going to reject it. So there will always be a localized infection around that drain. It'll have a little bit of pus around it, a little bit of scab around it. That is 100% normal. You worry about a drain being infected if you start seeing streaking erythema or red streaks going away from the drain or the area around the drain is very red. If the drain looks like normal skin with a little bit of yellow stuff, which we call fibrinous exudate, that's not pus. That's just your body's way of handling a foreign body. Not a big deal. You usually don't even have to worry about it if you're washing the area with soap and water. One other small thing to keep that entrance site healed is to make sure you tape your drain to one position. So if you have a drain coming out here, you don't want the drain going over here one day, here one day, here one day, here one day, because what it's doing is working out a bigger hole, a spiral effect, so your hole gets bigger. If you want to tape it down at 12 o'clock, tape it down at 12 o'clock every day, and that prevents it from healing. If you start getting skin excoriations around that site, flip it up or to some other position and leave it there. Making sure that your drain is not freely hanging out makes a huge difference in drain care. Um, I see patients come sometimes come in with them just pinned to their clothes. I see some people uh, put them in their pockets, their bra. I saw one lady, she actually crocheted a little thing for her drain, but she had it for like a month, so it was a whole different issue. Um, but yeah, just make sure you kind of hold it in the same position. As far as seeing if it is infected, redness, fever greater than 101.5, call your doctor 101, um, and if there's a change in the color of the fluid. The majority of the drains that we put in, if it is not in an abscess, should eventually, after 24 hours, turn clear. Looks like dark urine, um, ascites, just a clear-ish fluid. If it goes from clearish to straight blood, that's a problem. If it goes from clearish to pus, that's a problem, um, contact your physician. If it's red and it slowly turns light in color, that's okay. Um, if you see a little bit of red every once in a while and you become more active, that's okay. Um, we also ask that you record the output. If you put a drain in a space, the space is there, so we know that it is going to have fluid. Um, we don't want it to put out 100, 200, 300, 400 cc's. We would love to see it put out 100, 50, 70, I mean 25, 10. If it goes up to 50 one day and then back to 25, that's fine, especially if you are active and moving around. So when we ask people to record the quantity, 
it's really just to see it decreasing. If you put a drain in someone's belly after colon surgery, one day it might drain 100, the next day it might drain 400, the next day it might drain 50. That's not a problem as long as you don't have any redness, erythema, signs of infection systemically. Um, so it really just depends, but pretty much you should see your drain output decrease each day. If it doesn't, again, contact your physician. Um, lastly, clogging, leaking. Um, you'll see some people have drains that are doing fine and all of a sudden they just stop draining and then fluid runs around the actual site. Comes out where the JP goes in. 100% normal, don't worry about it. A lot of times that means the drain is clogged. We'll come in and strip it and we'll show you how to, it's not like strip or pull, strip it, it's just gonna pull stuff out. But we strip the tubing um, or milk the tubing so that you can get any stuff that's blocking it. Sometimes we'll do that and a lot of fluid will come out. The easiest way to describe that is if this is the end of the drain and this is the part going into the belly, you grab it here right up to the belly wall, take um, either a wet something or an alcohol swab and squeeze the tube and you think you squeeze it as hard as you can and you milk the stuff down, let go, hold it here, milk it down. And what will happen is you'll see stuff come out all of a sudden. That's what stripping a JP drain is or milking a drapey drain. Um, a lot of these are traditionally one-way drains, especially the active ones. What that means is you can't really stick something in there to get stuff out and get it moving. A lot of times we get calls from um, other services, hey, we got a uh, chest tube that's not draining. We see a big clot in it. Can you come in, stick something in it and pull it out? No, you cannot because again, Everything is actively draining. It's a one-way valve or a one-way drain so that anything in there comes out. Once we start sticking stuff in it, then you start getting bacteria in spaces that you don't want. And you turn a clogged drain into one that's infected. Whole different problem. Now, these passive drains, because stuff is going both ways, even though it's draining out by gravity, bacteria is crapping, is kind of creeping in. We don't worry about that. Most of the time we use this, there's either a big enough hole to where, even if it gets infected, it's going to be superficial and when we remove the gauze or whatever, the infection will come out. Or we're not really worried about an abscess healing because we have a big enough skin hole to where to drain. The other thing with um, passive drains is you want to get to a situation where you don't have to have these. <clears throat> Sometimes it's just time, but passive drains are also nasty because they're, again, a foreign body. You're not sucking stuff out and it's draining a lot. So they're a lot harder to take care of. Patients hate them, um, but we have to do them sometimes. Um, even in situations like uh, fistula and anos, we place a seton, which is a passive drain that goes around through the fistula and we tighten it over time to pull it out. Those areas get infected, they're painful, they're tender, but once we get them out, everything usually heals well and the patients don't have any problems. Another way to look at a drain is not so much passive and active as to think of it as if I have a abscess in a cavity that I can't drain, open to the skin like a lung, like a liver, like um, an appendicitis for whatever reason. You can't just open it up and drain it because intestine comes out in the abdomen. Um, you can't do it in the lung because you will lose your negative pressure and your lung goes down um, and your spleen. You can't just cut it open because the spleen's moving around. In those situations, we typically use a suction drain to suck the fluid out, but it is still the same process as a passive drain, allowing the pus to come away from the area so the body can heal. When it heals from the inside out, pull the dressing out and you don't need it anymore, or pull the drain out when you don't need it anymore. So really all of this drain care is either preventative abscess care or current abscess care. Um, you never put a drain in for bleeding. If you have a lot of bleeding, you go stop the bleeding. Um, if you're in a case and there's a lot of bleeding for whatever reason, we will put a drain in it sometimes because we don't want the clots to stay there and get infected because maybe we're working on the colon at the same time. Or if there's a high risk of it developing a leak, we want to know something about the wound. But you never say, oh, there's a lot of bleeding, I'll just put a drain. 
stop the bleeding, and then worry about the rest. Hopefully this covers pretty much everything for drains. If you have specific questions, as always, call me and I'll get them answered or DM me or Instagram or hit the like and subscribe, whatever you're supposed to do. All right, guys, take care. Thank you. Pardon? <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with thunder with the rain. <laughs>